Take your Bibles, if you would, if you're able to stand, please stand tonight. We're going to look at James chapter 4, verse number 8, and then we're going to look over to Psalm chapter 73. James chapter 4 and Psalm chapter number 73. I'd like to speak tonight of the subject of draw nigh to God. Draw nigh to God. James chapter 4, verse number 8, the Bible says this. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. By the way, that is what is commonly called a conditional promise. God says, if you will do this, then I will do this. Seek me and I shall be found. Draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. What a great promise. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. I wonder why that's included in that epistle. Because God only hears us when we have a clean heart. Which is why the Lord says, search me. Try me, see if there be any wicked way in me, is what David said. He knew he had to have a cleansed heart. Look over at Psalm chapter 73, verse 28, if you will. Psalm 73, verse 28. The Bible says this, But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. But it is good for me to draw near to God. Let's pray this evening. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you for our church. I thank you the pastor had the vision to come here when he was voted in by 12 people. For a church that had the vision to start a college some 23 years ago. That's gone forward to building program after building program. But Lord, I believe that we have a clarion call from your word that we are to draw nigh to you. I pray you help us to learn some things tonight and understand some reasons why we ought to draw nigh to you that will enable us and encourage us to do what you have commanded us to do. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. It was about 37 years ago, and I had started dating my wife for the first time. I asked her out for a first date in March, and uh, it did not go well. <laughs> I first went to her brother-in-law, Dr. Toby Weaver. I said, Dr. Weaver, what do you think, me, think about me dating your sister-in-law? Dr. Weaver's known for being encouraging, but he wasn't encouraging to me. He said, you're both a little bit different. It might work. <laughs> what in the world? I'm telling the truth. But that was enough encouragement for me, and so I decided to ask her out. This is before we had computers. We had typewriters back then. Some of you might remember IBM Selectrix. My wife taught typing in shorthand. That's something else that's faded into obscurity. And uh, I went down to her room, and she, was, she had a very busy social schedule. I'll just say that. Um, I mean, every day it was somebody else at lunch. I, I think her motto was, so many men, so little time. And uh, <laughs> I walked down to the typing room, and I said, have you had lunch yet today? And by the way, ladies, this is because men have very fragile psyches. And she says, no, I have not had lunch. I'm going, but I knew I needed to cover myself a little further. I said, has anyone asked you to lunch today? You said, no. I'm going, yes. Then I said, well, would you like to have lunch with me today? She said, no. <laughs> Ms. Downey, that's enough laughing out of you. <laughs> when people enjoy pain, that's called masochism, okay? <laughs> Brother John knows that. Well, praise the Lord, the next time she said yes, we began to date. And well, that summer she went home to where she was from, which was Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was teaching summer school that summer. As we got into the midst of the summer, this is hard for you college students to understand this, but we did not have cell phones back then. We had tin cans with like a little string between them. And uh, no. I called once a week on Saturday. It was very expensive. I would write letters to her, and boy, she'd write to me. It was great. But in the middle of the summer, we had a day off the 4th of July. And man, I was going to go see my girlfriend. I was excited about it. Well, I was going to leave the day before we had school that day. So I taught till noon. I got in my car and I drove the 555.9 miles from Crown Point to Chattanooga. Eight and a half, nine and a half hours. And I couldn't wait to get there. I drove down there to 1910 Bennett Avenue. It was dark, it was late, had never been there before, had to find the house. Remember, we didn't have GPSs, we didn't have iPhones. I'm wandering around Chattanooga, which is not a good place to wander around in. And uh, finally, I found her house, knocked on it, and she opened that window to see if it was me, and she smiled. It was all worth it. Ten hours of driving. 
The next morning we got up, we had breakfast together. Her mom, back in the day, almost 40 years, she made amazing biscuits. And I'm talking, they were, I couldn't figure out why they were so good. Now in the, house, in the South, they make things that taste good that are extremely bad for you. And I found out how she did this. She would make her biscuits, and then she would take some Crisco, heat it up in the stove so it was liquid, and she would dip each biscuit front and back in Crisco. So it came in a kind of a nice crunchy edge on the outside, soft and fluffy on the inside. I kept eating them to see if they were as good as I thought they were. It was amazing. <laughs> so we had breakfast, then we went, we had a picnic in the park. At about 1 o'clock, I got back in my car, back 555.9 miles, all the way back to Indiana, where I was teaching school the next day. You say, it must have been horrible. That was awesome. I would have drawn nigh to her. <laughs> Not you, her, okay. Right. Look at down there. No, over here. It was worth it. Now, can I say this? I love my wife. She's my best friend. We'll celebrate our 37th wedding anniversary this year. I still look forward to getting back to see her. Last week I was preaching in Orlando, Florida. The week before that I was in Pennsylvania. Next week I'll be in Washington. When I get back, she always greets me. She still smiles. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I, look forward to, I look forward to drawing nigh to her because I love her. Can I ask you this evening, do you look forward to drawing nigh to God? Now, you say, well, Dr. R, here I am. I'm in church tonight. I'm aware of that. And we know how to draw nigh with, to God externally. And God's Word gives us a warning about that in Isaiah chapter 29. Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. Are we drawing nigh to God with our heart? The psalmist said, Psalm 119, verse 10, With my whole heart have I sought thee. No wonder David was a man after God's own heart. It says that in 1 Samuel 13, 14, and again in Acts 13, 22. Because with his whole heart he sought God. Now God commands us. He says, draw nigh to me. Tonight I want to share with you a few simple reasons as to why we should draw nigh to God. I realize that we probably should never ask why. That's what little kids do. Why do I have to do this? But sometimes as Christians we ask, why am I doing this? Can I give you some Bible reasons why each of us should draw nigh to God? The first thing we say, let me say this, Oswald Chambers, who was a great writer, said in a book, Enjoying Intimacy with God, we are at this moment as close to God as we really choose to be. I think that's so true. True, there are times when we would like to know a deeper intimacy, but when it comes to the point, we are not prepared to pay the price involved. College students know I often challenge them, did you have your quiet time this morning? Did you take time to read the Word of God? Did you take time to talk with God? Because I want them to draw near to God. I believe tonight that we will draw near when we realize, first of all, that He is our source of forgiveness. He is our source of forgiveness. He's forgiven us for everything we've ever done wrong. What a wonderful Savior we have. Luke chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, we read about a woman who comes and from an alabaster box, she pours ointment on the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible goes on to say that she washes his feet with her tears and with her hair. That's pretty remarkable. She washed his feet with her tears and her hair. You say, why would she do that? Interestingly, the Bible gives us the, re the reason. Jesus said in Luke chapter 7, verse 47, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Can we not all say tonight that we've had our sins forgiven? Buried in the deepest sea, as far as the east is from the west, our sins, which were scarlet, we're now as white as snow. And then on top of that, he remembers our sins no more. 
I tell people who couples retreats, my wife and I have had the privilege of doing 80 or 90 of them across the country. I say one of the great things, once you said you forgive someone, don't bring it up again. But I must admit tonight that it's hard to forget. Time will heal some things, but it's hard to forget things. But God remembers our sins no more. We are forgiven. What a wonderful thing. Have you ever had someone forgive you of something? I think all of us have been forgiven something. He said, oh, don't worry about that. I forgive that debt. I forgive that wrong. I forgive you for what you said. Jesus forgave us for sinful life. Because of that, we ought to draw nigh to him. Secondly, tonight, I believe we ought to draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is our source of healing. He is our source of healing. With college students and with our Antelope Valley Bible class, I often visit people in the hospital. I went and saw Brother Phil Sombrano today, and Brother Ollie Winheim just brought him back tonight, last night, from the hospital down below, and he's been in the hospital. He's had several heart surgeries, and before I left him and I spent sort of my lunch hour with him, I took time and I prayed with him. I said, you know, we have a great physician, and he can heal us. It's a wonderful thing to know. But can I say this? The Bible says that God heals the brokenhearted. We're going to go through difficult times in life. I don't know if your heartache, what it will be aligned with. Maybe it'll be with finances. Maybe it'll be family. I talked to someone tonight who lost two family members recently. She said one of them wasn't saved. That's a difficult thing to deal with. It might be finances. It might be family. It might be physical health. The Tracy Ware, a very faithful usher here, has been battling a sciatica nerve and been in a wheelchair and a walker. That's horrible. But you know what? God gives us healing. He heals the broken heart and bindeth up their wounds. Ezekiel chapter 36, the prophet said this, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh, a soft and tender heart. Aren't you glad that God wants to heal us? Our sinful heart, our broken heart? He wants to work on our heart. Folks, how wonderful is that to know? Because out of the heart are the issues of life. He wants to help us with our heart. What a blessing, what an encouragement that is. He's the great physician. He made the blind to see. He made the lame to walk. He made the deaf ear to hear but he can also touch the heart of those who will draw near to him. Thirdly, we ought to draw nigh to the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the one from whom we learn. He wants to teach us. He was the greatest teacher who ever lived. I taught an education class this semester, and I often say, teach about and write about the teaching methods of the Lord Jesus Christ. What did he do? He was the master teacher. There was no greater teacher. They called him rabbi, which means teacher. Isn't it wonderful to know that he wants to teach us? He wants to teach us how to live. The disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And he answered them and said, This manner ought you so to pray, our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It's interesting. He taught them. My friends, he wants to teach us as well. One of our fine students and upperclassmen here asked me a question, emailed me a question this week about the Bible. He said, what does it mean when the Bible says he put his word above his own name? And I said this, Jesus was the living word. And the word of God is the written word. I said they both have high, high value. He put his word above his own name. Can I tell you, friend, tonight, do you know how he wants to teach you? What is by being in your place as you are tonight? I taught this morning in Genesis, Genesis 24, verse 27, I, being in the way, the Lord led me. But he also wants to teach us when we open his word and say, Lord, what do you have for me today? What do you want me to learn today? What does your Holy Spirit want to point out to me today? He wants to teach us. Are we trying to grow as a Christian? 
The Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. The Bible tells us to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's a command. But what a teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been teaching for the last several weeks for the Beatitudes. And I thought I'd do it a week or two. Now I'm in my fifth week. I'm on about the fifth verse. I'm going to make it an eight-week series. He teaches us how to live. He teaches us, by the way, one of those, what I taught on last Sunday, said we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Hunger and thirst after righteousness sounds very similar to seek me and you shall find me. Are we looking to learn from the Lord? Are we looking to learn from the Word of God? Or are we content to say, well, I just, I'm fine. There was a secular book called Good to Great. But a Christian man wrote a book called Good to Great in God's Eyes. A powerful book. Are we seeking to grow in the eyes of God? To be what he'd have us to be? Mary chose in Luke chapter 10 to sit at the feet of Jesus. A wise lady. She said, I want to learn. I want to learn from the Master. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, it says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. In Psalm 34, verse 11, it says, Come, ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. In Psalm 119, verse 27, it says, Make me to understand the way of thy precepts, so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. What are precepts? Those are his laws, those are his teachings. Help me to understand, Lord, what you're saying. In Psalm 143, verse 10, the psalmist said this, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. He will show us which way to go. He'll show us the path we ought to take. He'll show us what we ought to do today and tomorrow and the next day. But are we listening to allow him to teach us, to lead us? I believe that we will draw near to him when we know that he is the one from whom we learn. But then we also ought to draw nigh to God because he is the one to whom we owe thanks. I don't like to be indebted to people where I feel like I owe a thank you note for something and usually when I return from a trip I'll write thank you notes to several people and I'll thank them for allowing me to be there or for whatever they did for the situation for the college or whatever. And that's something certainly we ought to do. Most parents teach their children to say thank you at an early, early age. Can I say this? There is no one that we owe more thanks to than the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved us. He set us free. We were in bondage. Literally the chains of sin. But he set us free. Have we said thank you for that today? I try and I don't do this as well as I should. I try to be thankful for things that I have that others don't. I try to be thankful for my vision. I can't imagine being plunged in darkness and the guidance everywhere I went, no longer be able to read or see. That would be a horrible thing. I try to be thankful for the ability to hear. I'm thankful that I'm ambulatory, that I get up and walk. I know Brother Sobrano said today, well, I'd love to be there. I just, I just can't get up right now. We ought to be thankful for those things and so many others. You had a Christian home. I've told young people they need to be thankful for their parents. Maybe it's a pastor, a teacher, a youth pastor who impacted your life. Someone who preached a sermon that redirected the course of your life, maybe through salvation or dedication or direction. We have to be thankful for those things. But can I say this? We have to be thankful for Jesus. Many people are not thankful. I think they may be thankful in their heart. I think of the story of the ten lepers. Jesus healed ten, and only one came back. And the Bible says about the one who came back that he fell on his face and his feet, giving him thanks. By the way, it says that he was a Samaritan. He took time to be thankful. 
I really believe the other nine were thankful, but they were so excited, they were cleansed from this incredible disease. I'm sure they were rushing off to see their family or to go to the high priest to get approval to go everywhere at that point in time. Not have to shout, unclean, unclean, wherever they went. They didn't say thank you. The songwriter understood it well when he penned the words, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. We ought to thank him. We owe him thanks. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, every good and perfect gift cometh from above. Genesis 24, verse 1 says that Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Blessings come from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 13, it says also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. Now think about this. You should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all your labor. End of the statement. It is the gift of God. Of course, we ought to thank God for our food. Do we thank Him for our job, for our occupation, for the paycheck we receive? In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, the Apostle Paul talks about how he was thankful in everything. Are we thankful? Are we grateful to God who has done so much for us? Can I tell you, Lancaster Baptist Church, we are blessed to be in this church. I'm going to say this flat out. It's not a perfect church, and we don't have a perfect pastor, but we have a great pastor. We have a great church. I've had the privilege of being in 48 states in this country and well over 650 churches. We have a great church. Good things are happening here. Is it perfect? No. But we have so much to thank God for. Are you thankful for your Sunday school teacher? Are you thankful for the choir we hear? The specials we hear? The ushers that serve? Those who even now who are serving in the nursery or Cactus Kids Clubs. We have much to thank God for. He's been so good to us. And finally tonight, we ought to draw near to God because He is the one who will give us rest. It's interesting. In Luke chapter 8, verse 35, they found the man out of whom the devils were departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. <laughs> the world won't understand the peace we have. They'll never understand it. Great peace of they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. How do you handle that? The things people say, God gives his beloved rest. He gives us peace. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest is a good thing. Sometimes it just feels so good to lay down. I told my Sunday school class I was flying out on Wednesday to preach Thursday morning in Orlando, Lake Wales, about an hour and a half from Orlando, and the plane was delayed out of L.A. I'm going, oh man, I hope I can make my connection in Dallas. I went up and asked them, they said, oh, don't worry, your flight out of Dallas is way delayed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I was sad for a couple of reasons because Dallas has great restaurants in the airport. And I didn't think I'd have time to eat there, so I had a hamburger at LAX. And I mean, they have a place called Papacitos that has phenomenal fajitas. I wouldn't know about this. My wife told me about it, but just move me out here. <laughs> but I sat there for two hours, so instead of arriving and being at the camp where the Christian conference was at, at 12.30, I pulled into the conference center at 3.45 in the morning. And while some people can sleep well on planes, for some reason I do not. You probably cannot tell from your vantage point, but I'm a little bit larger than most human beings. I've traced my lineage back to the sons of Gath. And uh, <laughs> for those of you not versed in the Old Testament, that's Goliath's family. So, so I pinned in this plane, and I always ask for a window seat because I can put my shoulder in the window. I don't like touching people I don't know. It didn't work on that flight. I never got out of my seat. Three and a half hour flight from Dallas, to, it was horrible. Had to go get the car rental, drive there, finally got there, and I got in that bed. It felt so good just to lie down. 
You know what it's like when you're really, really tired? Can I say this? As a Christian, you will get weary. Which is why the Bible tells us, don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. But in the midst of serving God, he promises to give us rest. That's a blessing. That's an encouragement. The Bible says that we're to come to him and he will give us rest. Draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. A lot of times we may feel like, well, I don't really feel like I'm overly close to God right now. And I'm reminded of the story of the old couple that was driving down the road in their pickup truck and she said, we don't sit close like we used to sit. And the old gentleman said, I haven't moved. And God hasn't moved. He's waiting with arms open wide. It took me probably 20 years to really come to this conclusion. Why were we made? I've taught the book of Genesis over 50 times. Why did God put Adam and Eve here on the earth? Two reasons. To walk with God and to work for him. He came down every day of the cool of the day to walk with him and talk with him. And they were commanded to keep the garden. And that was before there was any sin. They had a job to do. My friends, I believe God wants us to walk with him and talk with him. He walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. What a wonderful promise from the Lord. The poet said this, I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish, I didn't take time to pray. Problems just tumbled about me, and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me? I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I tried to come to God's presence. I used all my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided, while my child, you didn't knock. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me. He answered me but you didn't seek. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish. I had to take time to pray. He's waiting. He's listening. No matter how difficult the situation is, he's always there. I read the story about a young man who was alienated from his family. He found himself homeless. Could you imagine what that's like? No home, no bed, no money, and on the street. He said he was terrified, spent time hanging out in the doors of buildings, and suddenly some other young men saw him and said, you don't know what to do, we'll show you what to do. And they took him to a food line, and he got some soup and some bread, and a cup of coffee. And then they said, well, there's a place you could sleep, but he went over and stood in line to a shelter. It had 100 beds. Soon every bed was filled, one man to a bed in a big, giant room. The young boy had never been in a place like that. After a brief period of time, they turned the lights off. You could hear the bed squeaking and people coughing as they tried to get settled for the night. The young man was terrified. And suddenly, over the corner, he heard someone speak up and say this, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In earth as it is in heaven. Other voices joined in. And the young man felt a peace come over him. He said, I don't think I've ever felt so close to God in my life before. I learned that wherever I was, God will be there with me. But my friends, it comes down to this. Will we choose to draw nigh to God?